So I've seen too many breakthroughs not to be optimistic because it's sometime in the darkest of the night that, you know, the sun's going to shine. And I believe that we're going to go through a lot, but I think that we'll be all right. It's going to be a turbulent flight in some pockets, but we're going to land this plane. Welcome to On Brand with Donnie Deutsch. I am Donnie Deutsch, and this is the show dedicated to, this is the podcast, I don't want to say it's a show, dedicated to a simple premise that everybody and everything today is a brand, every politician, every athlete, every uh, institution, every company, every product. Uh, if you've got a Facebook page, you're a brand. The brand is a set of values. And we do two things here. We, uh, we interview a big brand of the week, and this week's brand of the week, individual personal brand is Reverend Al Sharpton. Um, Reverend is, of course, probably the leading activist of uh, people of color in this country. Uh, he's got, obviously, his new book is in paperback. He's got he's got a show on MSNBC. He's the president of the National Action Network. And we're going to be talking to Reverend Al a lot about race and a lot about politics and a lot about his personal brand. But first, let's get to the brands of the week. Okay, uh, we're going to see who's up, who's down, which brands are kind of driving the zeitgeist about where we're going and which brands are winners and which brands are losers. Let's get right into it. First brand of the week is um, Saturday Night Live. Brand up for Saturday Night Live. They're back, uh, an institution, and particular brand up for a guy you're going to be hearing a lot about, James Austin Johnson. He's a new cast member on Saturday Night Live, and he played um, jo Joe Biden, probably the best Biden yet, I think. By, you know, Jim Carrey's played him, and uh, I forgot who else has played him, but here's this newcomer, and he also supposedly does a fantastic Donald Trump. We're going to see him doing that. So here's a kid out of nowhere, brand up for James Austin Johnson who's going to be the new Biden going forward on Saturday Night Live. And Saturday Night Live this week did kind of an interesting send-up on uh, Kirsten Sinema, uh, of course, the Democratic uh, senator from Arizona who's causing all kinds of problems. But welcome back, Saturday Night Live. Big brand down for Joe Biden. You know, he's been having a, a kind of a losing streak lately. And here, here's a very uh, telling, concerning poll from Gallup. Guess we, last week, Gallup fault. Uh, Biden's approval rating among independents falling 37%, the lowest it's been since Biden took office. It's now slipped 24 points below his 61% approval rating. That's amazing. The poll found that the president's approval on his handling of the pandemic dropped seven percentage points just from August to September. And Biden saw a nine-point drop among independents on his handling of infrastructure. Similarly, an Associated Press poll released Friday found Biden's approval rating among independents had dropped from 62 in July to 38 in September. So, you know, if you're not going to get the independents in this day and age, you're not winning the next general election. So obviously it's very early and this is just a snapshot, but uh, very concerning that uh, Joe Biden is, is losing dramatically uh, the independents. So brand down for him. Um, brand... Doesn't matter for Stephanie Grisham and her new book on Donald Trump. Um, she was, of course, uh, one of his press secretaries, and she's got a new tell-all book. And in it, it talks about, you know, uh, it, well, salacious things he said towards women. It talked about his tirades. It talked to him about private things he said to to um, uh, Putin, like, I got to be tough with you on stage. I mean, all these things. And I guess the reason I'm saying it's a brand, it doesn't matter. It, these books are not affecting one vote when it comes to Donald Trump. It's baked in. You know, there's nothing. Here we basically had the 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 Woodward book that talked about, you know, basically that yeah, we, he brought us, and we were so close to the possible brink of war that we had to have Miley, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, call his counterpart in China to say we're not going to launch nukes. And, you know, this stuff, I know people want to make money and whatnot, but I, there's nothing new in the way of salaciousness, stupidity, arrogance, obnoxiousness, incapabilities that's going to change this thing. It's to stop even bothering printing the book. So there you go. Um, brand down for Corey Lewandowski, of course, former uh, campaign manager uh, to Donald Trump. He keeps finding new lives with him, but he went too far. He's, he's been thrown out of the Trump orbit and here's why. And here's the, all you need to about Donald Trump. He supposedly grabbed the butt of one of uh, Donald Trump's fun, uh, big uh, uh, donors, wife, or I don't know if it was wife or a girlfriend, a wife, I think. And he supposedly touched her in the wrong way. And, you know, guy who gives tons of money. That's it. You're out, Lewandowski. It's not the fact, let's, let's be on record. It's not the fact that he grabbed a woman because we've seen him do physical uh, inappropriate things before where he kind of got in a fight with that reporter and kind of pushed her. But it's the fact that it might cost Donald Trump money. And that's, that's all you need to know about the Trump brand. At the end of the day, it's about his money. Don't fuck with his money. Go buy Corey Lewandowski brand down. Um, here is a Brand up for secessionism. That's basically people who want to split the union in two. And then this will be, this will, this will knock your socks off. 
A shocking new poll from the Center of Politics in the University of Virginia reveals that over half of Trump voters surveyed, and this is, and 41% of Biden voters are in favor of blue or red states seceding from the union. I want to say this again, because it's not just the red side, it's the blue side, that this is how divided we are. That basically a new poll from the Center for Politics, the Trump voters said that half of their voters want the red states to secede from the nation. Let's go back to the Civil War. Let's have our own nation. I'm not talking about slavery, but let's have our own, you know, individual nation. And four out of 10 Biden voters want to do it. This is this is where we've come. I mean, the words United States of America are, talk about a, a, a branding mis, um, misnomer. We are anything but the United States of America. But that was particularly um, stunning to me. Um, Merck. Brand up. And here's the interesting thing. I, this is why I'm bringing brand up is, is it's not just specifically because they're, now they have got a new pill that's going to reduce the risk of hospital, hospitalization, death by half of some patients. Um, it's the first pill that kind of treats symptoms and is going to really, really help. But I'm wondering, I'm bringing a brand question mark for Merck and for Pfizer. What does it have affect? What does doing what they've done for Corona affect their overall brand? So does it? I mean, Pfizer makes whatever, they make all kinds of drugs as does Merck and does it think the way you think? And and that's why it's almost weird that these, that these names, these Merck and these Pfizer's, other than instances like this, don't play a role. Like when you go out and you buy Zoloft or you go buy, you know, uh, uh, whatever the drug that you're taking is, whatever for high blood pressure, do you even know the company that, you know the name of the drug? So it's interesting, where do these corporate pharmaceutical brand names fit in? In this instance, they did, but on an ongoing daily basis, I don't think it matters. It's interesting. All right, YouTube, brand up. YouTube is banning prominent anti-vaccine activists and blocking all anti-vaccine tent, um, content. Um, you know, a lesson maybe for, for, for Facebook. It's taking down several video channels associated with high-profile anti-vaccine activists, including Joseph McCullough and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, it's part of a new set of policies aimed at cutting down on anti-vaccine on Google-owned sites. YouTube will ban any videos that claim the commonly used vaccines approved by health authorities are ineffective and dangerous. Yeah, take them down. There's no two sides to this. There's no, we need the other side. It's lying. It's killing people. And Facebook, get on the fucking program, Okay. Brand up for New York City schools and California schools. Um, Supreme Court uh, Sotomayor allowed the New York school vaccine mandate to, you know, from the, uh, to continue. And look, I said it before, and we're going to get into it in a couple of corporations also. There's no advertising that's going to fix the issue uh, as far as getting people to get vaccinated. There's no doctors can't even convince anybody anymore. You got to hit them where it hurts. You got to hit them either that you can't travel here or you can't go to school here or you can't work at this company. That's it. That's the game. This is, I mean, just perfect example. Tyson Foods, brand up, says 91% of its workforce is vaccinated after imposing the mandate. 91% of Tyson Foods' 120,000 person workforce has been vaccinated after the meatpacker announced the mandate in early August. The number has doubled. Okay, guess what? They said, we're a corporation. We can, we have rules the way we do things. If you want to work at this corporation, just like you can't work here with your shirt off, you can, I'm just making that up. You can't work here not being vaccinated. Obviously, a lot more serious. And guess what? They doubled the amount of people. That's it. This is the way you do it, guys. It's not common. United Airlines says almost all of its workers are vaccinated. Brand up. Touting success. 99% of its U.S.-based employees have met the company's requirement to get vaccinated. Guess what? Because they don't want to get fired. It's only 600 employees did not get vaccinated by the deadline, and they now face termination. That's it, kids. Not complicated stuff. Same thing, NBA. Now, the brand up. It's very interesting. They drew the line, you know, the stars, Kyrie Irving, who's the yuts, Andrew Wiggins, a few of them other, are balking at the COVID vaccine. So in their collective bargaining agreement with the players union, they can't actually make them put in their body, but nor, nor can anybody make it any in instance put in their body, or, nor, but they can't kind of ban them from the sport. But what they can do is for every game that you miss, you you don't get your your um, uh, salary for that game. And somebody like Kyrie Irving makes 400 grand a game. Let's see how many games he's going to miss when it costs him 400 grand a game or Andrew Wiggins 300. That is amazing. These guys, you go watch them play one night, they're making a half a million bucks. You know, it's just, just to go on the court, go up and down. I'm not saying they're not worth it. They put fans in the seats, but NBA brand up, that's the way you do it. Okay, Super Bowl, I guess a brand up for the halftime show. Here's, they announced their halftime show and it's basically... The, the Super Bowl is in California, so they're bringing together headliners on the show who kind of all start on the West Coast and started the West Coast hip-hop thing. They got Dr. Dre, Snoop, Eminem, Mary J. Blige, Kendrick Lamar. Um, but I don't know. I miss, you know, it, I, I'm not in the demo anymore. 
You know, I, I miss Bruce Springsteen. I miss the Rolling Stones. You know, I, I mean, even Beyonce. I mean, we sometimes I, last year we got really niche. I, I just don't know from a business point of view if you've got you know 180 million people, is this this group that you name them? Is that hitting it now? It, they're obviously great artists, and maybe I'm just out of it. I'm too old. But as I said, when do we get Springsteen back? Okay, that's just one guy or Stevie Wonder or uh, Billy Joel. I mean, come on, man. We can't just all have these hip, you know, new age, younger band. Not that they're, look, Dr. Dre's not young, I mean, nor Snoop. So I guess what I'm just, just talking about is um, I, I miss the, the old school rock and roll stuff there. Okay, a brand up for Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. They launched a gender-neutral kids clothing company. Um, basically that kids are the heart of creativity. They should be able to pick and choose what they want. The collection includes cashmere sweaters, trousers, cardigans, beanies, velvet shoes, suitable for children aged two to 10. I guess my question about gender non-specific clothes, other than like skirts and dresses, isn't everything kind of like that now anyway? You know, when you see people in sweats and athleisure and, and, um, you, there's, we're, I, do you even have to designate it now? I know there are men's and women's department. Maybe I haven't seen the line, so I don't understand it as much, but, um, uh, There you go. Brand up for Gary Vaynerchuk, a friend of mine. He's done the show before. Of course, huge social media guy. He's one of these guys who created NFTs. Now, if you don't know what NFTs are, they're uh, non-fungible tokens. Um, And they're basically, how do you explain what what it, it's so, if you don't understand, it's going to be hard to get. Christie's just auctioned with five artworks that are created by him for just over $1.2 million. And these are basic little scribbles that he does. And you own them. You don't even get the scribble. You get, just the kind of the the download of it, and you own it. I don't know, of course, download the actual whatever it is on on your phone that you have. Now everybody else can have it on the phone, but you have the original. You don't hang it on your wall, and these things are fetching insane amounts of money. It's just it, it was he has a, something called um, empathetic elephant fetched its highest price, selling for four hundred twelve thousand um, dollars. He did one of a gorilla, and so he's not the only one doing this stuff, but. For instance, in Christie sold an NFT by the artist Beeple for more than $69 million. So this here, guys, it's a new form of art. It's a new form of collection. It's part of the blockchain thing. It, it, it's all in there, but I'm still mystified, and I think most of my listeners are also. Okay, brand up from a business point of view, but brand down for hey, where are we going with the Squid Game. Now, the Squid Game is now the most is is the hottest new show on uh, Netflix, and it's um kind of like a Hunger Games thing. It's, 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 I think it's from Korea and it's basically 400 people or it's a drama are invited to play in a game. And because they're down on their luck and the winning prize is $39 million. But what they don't realize is you have to kill to eliminate, you kill somebody to eliminate from the game. And it's this twisted dark makes Hunger Games look like a, uh, you know, a, a Disney movie. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't know what, what the, what it is today that makes it so perfect for our culture, particularly Gen Z. It shows where characters have to perform useless tasks in order to marginally improve their luck of the draw. They do little children's games. It's so dark. It's so twisted. What is going on in our dystopian world now that this kind of entertainment, this very, and they say it's the most uncomfortable thing that you watch it afterwards and you're, you're just, you, 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 you're sweating, you're, you're uncomfortable. You're, I don't know. I'll watch old reruns of Hogan's heroes. Okay. Um, Tesla brand up. They sold 240,000 cars in the third quarter. They're up. Uh, that's from 100. They've almost doubled. Whereas General Motors in the last quarter saw a 33% drop to 400,000. By the way, now Tesla is making almost half as many cars as General Motors. I mean, it's just incredible. But their business has gone through the roof. The General is going down. I mean, that's it, man. Electric cars, get on the program. Beware or be square. Um, Dollar Tree, you know the Dollar Tree stores? And what's amazing about their brand is everything you buy in there is for a dollar or I think it's not a dollar less, it's just a dollar. Well, now everything they're going to start selling products for a dollar 25 or a dollar 50. Some of their stores are experiencing current tests selling items at higher price points. I guess the you know supply chain snarls have hurt them, but now dollar store, does that mean you, here's my branding question. Does that mean you change it to dollar and a half stores or dollar 25 stores? I think not. I think you keep it dollar brand. Um, and there you go. And finally, good news for me, good news for a lot of people. McDonald's announces the return of the McRib sandwich. Yes, the McRib. It is, if you haven't had it, it made its debut four days ago in Kansas City. It's a fan favorite. It's so gross that it's good. It's ribs, but without bones. And it's just um, mouthwatering. The McRib sandwich is back, and those are our brands of the week. 
Now let's get to our interview with the Reverend Al Sharpton. You're going to really enjoy this. He's our brand of the week, and here's the Reverend Al. Okay, I want to talk to you about Novo. Now, listen to me. Small business owners, startups, freelancers, entrepreneurs, do you know the number one way to avoid unfair bank fees? Well, first off, close your account. And second, open up a new Novo free business banking account. That's Novo, N-O-V-O. Novo is the number one business banking app because it's built from the ground up. It's simple and it's free business banking that Money Magazine called the best business checking account of 2021. With Novo, there are no minimum balances, no transaction limits, and no hidden fees. Sign up for free in under 10 minutes at banknovo.com slash onbrand. They'll mail you a Novo debit card and you get free ATM use. Novo makes banking easy and secure. You can manage your account in Novo's customizable web, Android, and iOS apps with built-in profit-first accounting and invoicing. Plus, you can tag each transaction and upload receipts. Uh, guys, this is a really smart thing. If you're any business owner in this, you don't want to pay fees. It's, the, it's really, really smart. It integrates with the most leading business tools and services like Stripe, Shopify, QuickBooks, and more for free. It offers over 5,000 perks and discounts just for finding, signing up. Get your free business banking account in just 10 minutes at banknovo.com slash onbrand. Go to banknovo, N-O-V-O dot com slash onbrand to sign up free right now and get a free copy of Novo's Small Business Starter Guide, banknovo.com slash onbrand. Okay, do you have an account with Coinbase or are you thinking of opening one? Do you own any Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, or any other cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency may represent the future of money. It's one of the most exciting investment opportunities to come around for some time, but what about taxes? This is where Alto IRA comes in. When you do anything in life, there's one way to do it, and then maybe there's a smarter way. You might already be investing in cryptocurrency, but did you know you can trade Bitcoin, Ethereum, and over 80 cryptocurrencies in a tax-advantaged IRA? With an Alto crypto IRA, you can trade crypto like Bitcoin and avoid or defer the taxes. I want to say this again. With an Alto crypto IRA, that's an Alto IRA, you can trade crypto like Bitcoin and avoid or defer the taxes. Get into investing in crypto and do it in a tax advantaged retirement account. Invest with as little as 10 bucks. Secure trading 24-7 through Alto's integration with Coinbase. And there's multiple ways to fund your account. Make a cash contribution, transfer cash from an existing IRA, or roll over to an old 401k. Ready to make your investments to the next level? Diversify like the pros and trade without tax headaches. Open an Alto Crypto IRA with as little as 10 bucks. Just go to altoira.com slash brand. That's altoira.com slash brand. Start investing in cryptocurrency today. Go to altoira.com slash brand. I am thrilled that today's guest, um, he's uh, an important part of our culture. Um, the Reverend Al Sharpton, his new book, not his new book, his new book in paperback, Rise Up, Confronting a Country at the Crossroads. He's, of course, the uh, host of MSNBC's Politi Politics Nation, just celebrated his 10th anniversary recently. Uh, he's got a radio show, Keeping It Real. He's, of course, founded the National Action Network. He's uh, written or co-written four books. And he's probably um, the most, one of the most important voices on race in the country today and has been an activist in, in all causes for people of color for years. A uh, uh, friend of mine. Welcome, Rev. How you doing, man? Good. Always glad to be with you, Donnie. Um, so first of all, what's the day, you know, I, you, you are a man of so many trades and so many visions and missions. What's a day in the life of the Rev? Like, give me your day to day. What, what's obviously you're doing the podcast and <laughs> take me through the rest of your day to day. I, I, I want to know what, what the hell are you doing? Because I don't know how you do it all. Well, I get up around four. I go uh, to the gym around five, work out for 50 minutes to an hour. And then I usually, uh, go back to my condo and read all the papers, then do the internet, and then head out. I uh, go to National Action Network uh, in the mornings, work there until around uh, 12, 12, 15. Then I do my radio show, syndicated radio show. It's on Sirius XM and 47 uh, uh, other markets on black radio. I do that for three hours every day, one to four. And then I go back to NAN to meetings till about seven to eight. And uh, usually I have a meeting at uh, the Cigar Club around 8 uh, <laughs> after that, and then I head home. That's when I don't do Politics Nation. I don't do on Sundays. I usually have to preach at a church after doing my Sunday morning radio show. Uh, and that's when I uh, don't I do Morning Joe. Uh, then I have to alter what time I want to work out. I do Morning Joe probably once or twice a week, and uh, Nicole Wallace uh, on Fridays. So, uh, and that's all, that's every day 
if there's not an emergency. If yeah. I'm in the middle of a George Floyd or Trayvon Martin, of course, all that alters. But that's my regular day, seven days a week. I'm on radio seven days a week, on TV twice a week, on my show, and at least twice a week on other shows. Hardest working man in showbiz. Rev, the, the show is on brand, and we we you know the whole premise of the show is that everybody and everything is a brand today. Every religion, every every politician, every what's the what's the Reverend Sharpton brand? Activist minister. I think that uh, uh, when I was young, I started preaching when I was a kid, literally. And four, I was four like, years was it four years old? Four years old, I preached my first sermon. From the 900 people at a Pentecostal church, Washington Temple Church. I, I want to stop. I want to stop you right there. How did that come to be? At four, because at four, I'm learning to walk. So, I, <laughs> did you just turn to your to your what? How did that give me that moment? That all of a sudden you're at four years old preaching. You know, I used to go to church with my parents, uh, who later separated. But at that time, we were together. Father was a businessman, and for whatever reason, I'd come home and take my mother's bathrobe. And put it on like the bishop's robe uh -huh. and preach to my sister's dolls. That's how I started. <laughs> and uh, I, literally, that's how I started. So about when I was three, three and a half, uh, they, my mother had me sign in to become one of the junior ushers in church. And that's where you help the older ushers seat people and give them the program mm -hmm. books and all. And they decided they were going to have a junior ushers anniversary program that year. And they asked all the kids, what did they want to do on the program? A kid that grew up with me that later was a star on Broadway and hair named Ronnie Dyson. He said he wanted to read a poem. He was about two years older than me. So I was four, he was six. My sister who was three years older than me, wanted to sing a song. I said I wanted to preach. And all the other kids started giggling and laughing. And uh, the adult supervisor said, don't laugh. She laughed. She brought me to the bishop. And she said, well, maybe, you know, it's Pentecostal church. Maybe the bishop said, maybe God's called him to preach. Let's see what he does. And the day came, they put me up there. I wasn't scared, and I started preaching. And What, uh, what the heck did you, were you preaching about at four years old? I preached about what I heard the bishop say. I, I was always like a sponge. So I could literally remember different sermons that he had meshed together, and I could put together eight, ten minutes of that. And I think the fact that I was so young and didn't uh, have any shyness and could literally say things I heard said, that in of itself was what impressed adults. There's about 900 people. We sat maybe 1,500, and it was half full, more than half. And it became an attraction in the church. So from age four to about eight, I would do uh, youth sermons in the church. Then they started inviting me to other churches. And then... Uh, one of the biggest gospel singers of all time came through our church, heard me, and she let me preach during intermission in her concerts, Mahalia Jackson. Wow. And uh, an interesting story that people don't know is that the probably the most popular black minister at the time was Reverend C.L. Franklin. And he and his daughter used to come to our church, and he would hear me preach, and he would talk about me. And his daughter was Aretha Franklin. Aretha and I knew each other since before I was 10 years old. And uh, she used to tell people, you guys know him as civil rights leader. I know him as the boy preacher in Brooklyn. And uh, that's why we were close. I ended up speaking at her funeral. Uh, but when I became about 10 years old, when I was 10 years old, my parents broke up. So we, uh, my mother and my sister and I had to move from Brooklyn, from uh, Queens back to Brooklyn. Where, where, in, where, in, where in Queens did you grow up? Where, Never where, anything about. Rev, where in Queens did you grow up? Hollis. I grew up in Hollis Hills, 212th Street, 85th Avenue. I was 199th Street, 104th Avenue. <laughs> we probably, that's right probably, a, it's about a mile from each other we grew up. That's right, crazy. That's right. right. Yeah. And uh, that, I know exactly where Hollis Heights is. Well, my father, when I was three, had made enough money to move to Hollis. But when he left us, he abandoned us. So we're in, in Brooklyn. My mother, in the project, had to get welfare. My father didn't do anything for us. And I never lived like that. That's when I started saying, well, why is it different here than it was in Hollis where we grew up? And that's where I learned the difference with zip codes. So I started watching the news a lot, and I fell in love with Adam Clayton Powell. And I went up to his church, Abbott Senior Baptist Church, and he knew me from my bishop. I'm like 11 years old now. And he, I used to hang out with Powell. And I decided then I wanted to be a different kind of preacher. I wanted to be a preacher like him. I wanted to be an actor. 
And I chose that route. I didn't want a, a one church. I was influenced by Jesse Jackson by then, who became uh, uh, someone my mother brought me to him and Reverend Jones. And my brand became activist minister because there are a lot of activists that are not church-based, a lot of church-based people that are not activist-based. And uh, You I were ordained at age 10. You were ordained at age 10. Right. That's ordained crazy. Ordained at age 10. But my, my, my activism came out of my church background. And my structure, National Action Network, came out of that. Don't forget, Martin Luther King named his organization, which I became youth director in New York at uh, age 13. He named it the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So people don't understand that there's a difference between the secular activists and those that are church-based because we base a lot of it on moral principles and nonviolence and mm -hmm. reconciliation. And theirs is a different model. Ours is based on charismatic leadership, kind of uh, uh, a, a it flows to the top of leadership. Theirs is more decentralized, but all of it for the same goal. Okay, if you're anybody involved in making any kind of content, I want to talk to you about Canva. That's right. It, it, it will help you design anything like a pro on any device. Canva Pro, that's C-A-N-V-A, is a design platform that empowers you to create and share stunning content in just a few clicks. Designing with Canva Pro is amazingly fun and fast. Choose from thousands of templates that are easy to customize or start from scratch. It has endless premium fonts, photos, uh, videos, and so much more that add personal edge to whatever you're designing. I'm telling you, this library of tools, whatever you're making, you go on there and it's like you, this cavalcade of stuff that you get to use. Designing together has never been easier. Sharing, editing, and commenting in real time. Canva Pro helps you stay organized on the same page and on top of team projects. Plus, your four teammates can unlock everything Canva Pro has to offer for just $12.99 a month. With Canva's Pro content planning, you'll save time planning, creating, and posting social media content. Uh, schedule posts and edit them at any time. This, I'm telling you, this thing is great. You got. I, I'm, I'm a creative guy. I've used this thing. It's, it's really helped me. It's helped me organize. It's helped me design. It's called Canva Pro. And design like a pro with Canva Pro. Right now, you can get a free 45-day extended trial when you use my promo code. Just go to canva.me slash Donnie to get your free 45 extended trial. That's canva, C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash Donnie. Canva.me slash Donnie. Do it. This episode is brought to you by Four Sigmatic, a wellness company that is well known for, get this, it's delicious mushroom coffee. It's real organic, fair trade, single origin, Arabica coffee with lion's mane mushroom for productivity and shaga mushroom for immune support. It's good stuff, guys. I'm telling you, it's organic. It's really good. Um, I've tried it. Uh, it. I know it makes me focus. I get, I get a lot of stuff done. I feel a little bit of an uptick in productivity. Uh, it's easy on my gut. doesn't leave me with that awful jittery feeling, a midday crash. Um, all, pro all products from Four Sigmatic are organic, vegan, and gluten-free. Plus, every single batch is a third-party lab tested to ensure its purity and safety. Over 20,000 five-star reviews. Love it. Four Sigmatic backs their products with a 100% money guarantee. Love every sip or you get your money back. I'm telling you. Now, you're probably thinking, this is coffee take like mushrooms. It tastes amazing, just like the coffee you've been having, but it's really healthy stuff. We've worked out an exclusive offer with Four Sigmatic on their best-selling mushroom coffee. But this is just for On Brand with Donnie Deutsch listeners. Get up to 40% off and free shipping on mushroom coffee bundles. To claim this deal, you must go to foursigmatic.com slash Donnie. This offer is only for On Brand with Donnie Deutsch listeners. It's now available for their regular website. I'm telling you guys, good stuff. You'll save up to 40%. Get free shipping. Go right now to four, F-O-U-R, Sigmatic, S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C dot com slash Donnie. Fuel your productivity, creativity with some delicious mushroom coffee. Give it a try. You know, I, I want one other thing in your past. I'm talking. I want to spend most of the time talking about obviously the events today. There, there's so much to talk about that I did not know about you. That you were James Brown's uh, Matt tour manager, and he was like a father to you. And talk to him about the early days with James Brown. I, I know I, I knew, know so much about you. I just didn't know that. 18 years old, I had my own youth group in uh, Brooklyn, National Youth Movement. It was called. Young man comes joins the group. His name's Teddy Brown from Augusta, Georgia, wanted to go to Columbia Law School. We found out his father was James Brown, the godfather of soul, who at that time, we're talking 72, was the hottest artist in the country, a black artist. And about six months in, Teddy got killed near Albany, New York, in a car accident. James Brown flew to New York, 
the biggest black disc jockey in New York at the time was a guy named Hank Spann. And Hank Spann told uh, Mr. Brown, he said, you know, last time you were here, uh, some people picketed you because you endorsed Richard Nixon. They were mad at you, even as popular as you are. If you want to do a show in memory to your son, there's this teenage preacher. He's 18 going on 19. His son had joined his group. You should do it with him. Nobody will pick at him. He's been in civil rights for like eight or 10 years. He's a kid. And uh, you can give him part of the money and memorialize your son. Brought me to James Brown. We met. James Brown agreed to do it. We packed the theater. He loved it in Brooklyn. Nobody picking at him. Two weeks later, he calls me and says, I want you to give me the award you gave me that night on Soul Train, which was the biggest thing in the uh, world. I grew, I grew up on Soul Train. Yeah. Gave me the award. And little by little, he would call me to do things. How's your youth group going? You need any money? And over a period of time, he said, I see in you the same vigor that I saw in my son, Teddy. I got other kids, but they don't have that kind of vigor. And I said, you know, the only recreation I remember of my father, who left when I was 10, is he would take me to see you at the Apollo Theater. And little by little, I became the replacement for his oldest son, and he became the father I never had. And we bonded. And uh, sometimes he would call me and ask me to go on the road uh, for the weekend with him because uh, he wanted to do certain things, and he just wanted me to come. He'll send me back home. And I said... Well, all right. He says, but I don't want you in show business. I want you to stay in the ministry. I promise your mother, I'm not going to let you get your hands dirty. And I would go to the shows, get his money, make sure he was paid, the band was paid, and I'd have to sit in the dressing room. He didn't want me out there where they served alcohol. He didn't want me running their girls. He was a preacher. He was real strict. Now, he had all the girlfriends he wanted, but he was very strict on me. Mm -hmm. And i never forget uh, uh, Donnie, 19, uh, I, I think it was 80. Two, they were. We were all riled up. We wanted a federal holiday for Martin Luther King, and uh, James Brown, who was always very conservative, very conservative, and and the Republican, he said to me, "I don't know why y'all are marching. I can call the president, and we can meet and get that." I said, "Well, you should call him. We're in his office in Augusta. It's about eleven in the morning." He tells the secretary, "Get President Reagan on the phone," and I said to myself, "Yeah, right." And, of course, she puts a call through, leaves a message and all. We go on about the day, went out to eat, did whatever we had to do. I'm getting ready to go back to New York the next day. To my surprise, about 5 o'clock, the intercom goes. She says, the White House is on the phone. And Brown looks at me like I told you so. He gets on the phone, and they said, President Reagan will meet with you on uh, January 15th, which was King's Day. So, obviously, Reagan's using it as a photo op mm -hmm, to offset sure. the box. Yeah. Brown tells me I've got to go. We go on the plane going is when he says to me, Reverend, I want you to do me one favor. I said, what? He said, I want you today because we meet tomorrow with the president and vice president. Bush. I want you to go. I'm going to take you my hairstylist in Washington. Style your hair like mine. When people see you, I want you to see me. Your reflection of me. You're like my son. And I did it. And we um, met with the president. Uh, we came out. And on the way back, he said, I want you to keep your hair like that until I die. A lot of guys would say to me, you can't wear no comp. This is the age of the Afro. Get that sure. out of your hair. But it was my bonding with James Brown because my father never asked me to do anything to reflect him. And James yeah. Brown did. And to this day, it's grayer now. My style came from James Brown. You, It's interesting. And we've probably been talking about 10, 15 minutes. And you brought up your dad and your dad leaving a few times. How how has that informed who you are, um, your your dad and and his lack of presence in your life? Uh, we, obviously, you've probably done a lot of searching about that, and it's it's you know we all kind of are products of our upbringing. But how has that kind of been built into your DNA and formed your who you are, how you do things, and what you're about? I think it it had a tremendous impact. It, it one I didn't have a father figure at home, so I had to learn manhood. Uh, uh, by trying to take, take bits and pieces from others. My bishop, uh, James Brown, uh, Jesse Jackson, uh, uh, who were all much older than me. And second, you felt that you had to make it on your own. There was nobody going to give you something. But my mother was on welfare, could barely make ends meet. And I felt responsible for her and my sister. So I think it made me grow up early 
it made me feel like, uh, you know, that you got to depend on nobody but yourself. It gives you trust issues. And it makes you an amalgam uh, amalgamation of all these father figures that you had that are in different trades, but it didn't, uh, uh, it becomes a mixture with you. You couldn't get more opposite than James Brown and my bishop, but I could blend them. Put them together. So yeah. it gives you your own unique style, but at the same time, it makes you totally uh, uh, independent and, and, and really trying to figure life out because there's no man there to tell you uh, what you need to know from about how to deal with uh, women, how to deal with shaving. I mean, none of this. I'm two sure. years old. Yeah. What, what's interesting, what's, what's fascinating, Rob, is, uh, Rob, is you took obviously a negative turn to a positive, but how we, I, look, I had the greatest dad in the world. I lost him a few years ago, but we fashion ourselves, you know, after a man, you were able to kind of take the best of a bunch of men and put that together. That, that, that's, uh, that, 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 that's fascinating. Let, um, I want to kind of drift into politics a little bit. And before we just kind of talk about some of the things that's going on with voting rights and, and, and uh, the George Floyd bill or what's not going on with them is I got to ask you about your former friend, my former friend, because we get asked this a lot about the former president, uh, Donald Trump, because we quote unquote, we're friends of his. And you and I both know a friend means You'd interact with him in the media. You'd see him at, at, you know, charity events. And, you know, he doesn't have any real friends. His friends were all kind of TV friends or political friends or whatnot. And I get asked this question all the time. Did you see the dark side? Did you, did you, you know, didn't, did you, didn't you see this? And, and my answer is always, I'm curious what yours is. I knew he was full of shit. I knew he was, a, you know, I wouldn't want to be in a foxhole with him. He wasn't a good guy, but I, you just thought he was a lounge act. And I, I didn't see that dark dark, dark core. And I'm curious because your kind of interaction over the years is similar to mine in, in how you knew him. And I'm curious your take now looking back. I met uh, uh, Trump. I first heard of Trump when he, they had this discrimination suit against his father in Brooklyn and all, so we didn't like him. And, uh, but Don King, who I met through James Brown, because James Brown sang at the uh, Ali uh, Foreman fight. Don King called me one day and said, I want you to go and meet Atlantic City, uh, and we're going on Donald Trump's helicopter. So that's the first time I ever really had a one-on-one -on -one with Trump. And I never get the ride. We're flying down to uh, uh, Atlantic City in Trump's big black helicopter. And it's me sitting here, Don King and Donald Trump sitting there, and both of them talking. And it's the most unreal 45 minutes I've ever had because both of them literally talking it almost like they're not coming up for air <laughs> and not hearing nothing the other saying. I mean, just self-promotion. <laughs> and I raised that to say I never really changed my opinion of Trump because I felt from that ride to seeing him 500,000 times since then at ringside at fights, he'd invite me to affairs. Uh, we, we would, uh, uh, I would call him and say I wanted him some of his construction he's never doing in Chicago to use black businessmen, whatever. I saw him as a self-promoter that you knew in the music world that I met with James Brown. He was no different to me than the concert promoter that James Brown said, this guy's going to beat me out my money, make sure you count it all and make sure that it's not counted. Mm -hmm. That's where I saw him at. I had no idea that he was that far on the dark side. I just thought he was a hustler. Yeah, and exactly. You, you, would never, you would think that and you maybe you would hope that if he ever got in a position out of that, out in the power, he'd grow into it and be fair and be humane. Mm -hmm. But I had no idea that he, to the core, was the kind of narcissistic autocrat that he ended up being. There's no way you could. There's no reference point that would make you feel that. Yeah, yeah. Is and I don't know which is worse. Is is Donald Trump a racist or a transactional racist? I think that he is a transactional racist, which makes him the worst kind of racist because he knows better. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, when if you got a guy down south that the whole culture was that way and and the whole environment was that way and he's a racist because of that's where he naturally was, that's one thing. But he grew up in Queens where he knew the difference and still chose to play the race card when he wants which mm -hmm. is more cynical to me than the guy that's a victim of his culture. He was not a victim of his culture. He knew that he could get ahead playing race, and he played it. He also knew it was wrong because he was in a city where uh, blacks were not in the back of the bus. So I think he's the worst kind of race. I couldn't agree with you more. 
I, I also, I, I ponder how not only did he get elected, but 40% of the country after he got elected said, yeah, we'll take four more years of this. And I always get, you know, being on TV and whatnot, I, I get asked a lot as you do. And, and my answer is a simple one, is that he uses the the autocrat, the the Hitler playbook uh, of basically creating another, that you get enough people, white people, who are afraid and, and and basically say, no, your problems are not your fault. It's the brown person's fault. It's the black person's fault. It's the Jew's fault. It's the media's fault. It's the rich person's fault. And that you prey on that. And then if that's your core message, that people will overlook just about everything else, and that explains Donald Trump. Am I oversimplifying it? No, I think you're absolutely on, on target there. I think that I would only add, not only does he play the card of, as you very accurately and said very well, play the blame game. He also got help where it comes in that the census says by 2040 or whatever the date, that sure. the majority of the country will be minority. So he plays on, they're taking the country from us. We're not mm-hmm. going to be the majority no more. And and, and that's that fear, particularly in belts in this country, that never imagined that, that, that whites would not be the overwhelming majority of the country which they're still going to be the biggest segment. It's just going to be more of different kinds of people. Sure. Uh, it scares, it terrifies people. And he becomes their last linchpin to hold on to this imaginary white dominance. And he plays on that, which is why they didn't care what he tweeted. They didn't care what he said. They didn't care what he did. They were holding on to this kind of salvation of whiteness. And let Trump do what he wants. He's the only thing we've got to hold on to. You know, as a guy who is this city and, and travel, you know, kind of it's a, such a big part of your DNA as it is mine. The troubling thing to me is, you know, we have a view of the racist, as you said, down south and it's in the culture and they know, know there's ignorance. And I see in this city a lot of what I call soft racism, where it's basically a lot of people we interact with who just underneath the surface will basically operate from that same fear as, oh my God, white's going to be a minority going forward in this country and educated people and, and high-minded people. And I want to say high-minded people, but that it's, it's a lot more prevalent and I see it in the people interact with. And I have, I have people that I know well that they will basically for it's one, if it's one less dollar, they have to pay in taxes. They will overlook everything else and that they give a shit about their pocketbook and that they just, they're not, it's not, they're not using racial slurs, but they want to keep things the way they are. We don't want to share anymore. Let's just, and it's a soft racism that's, it's equally as heinous. No, it, it, it is equally as heinous. And, and the thing that's disturbing about it is it, they, they're not even conscious of it. They feel because they're better mannered that they're better people, but they're not. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it takes people, that's one of the reasons uh, that uh, I've always respected you because even in private circles, you'll call them out on it. I mean, one-on-one yeah. stuff. You don't get on the soapbox necessarily. Well, you will. But, I've uh, lost friends. I have. You, I, I have. Uh, I don't uh, get invited to certain parties now because of that. I mean, exactly. God bless. I don't need to and, be at those and, fucking parties. And that's parties. what I'm yeah. saying. There's a rare person like like you, Donnie, that even at the high brow, you know, high end parties, will say, "No, I don't agree with that," <laughs> which means they're not yeah. going to invite you back. But everybody kind of goes along silently co-signing yes. stuff yes. that uh, you just wouldn't do. And I think that that's the only thing that in many ways make these people accountable the way they have to, even if it's when they go home in the middle of the night, say, no, Donnie, check me on that. Am I being biased? Because they get a- away with it. People, the price people pay to be in their presence is silence. And that's a price that, that none of us can pay. And I've always respected that about you. So how am I, as a white guy, how am I, it's interesting that there's two ways, well, black guy's going to look at the same way, but I'm, I'm speaking as a white guy. And there's two ways to look at where, where we are in race right now. There is uh, the, oh my God, look, the problems we have, we're still electing Donald Trump and uh, we're at a point where we've got voting rights that are turning backwards that obviously are, are, are aimed at people of color. Um, we're still fresh off George Floyd, a, a public execution of, of a black man at the hands of a white police officer. And, you know, you have a Kevin Hart coming out and saying, you know, it, there's never been a 
we've never been worse in race and, and issues of white supremacy. And you know, on the other hand, uh, Bill Maher did a piece a few weeks back that was was kind of compelling about progressives that the, the the banner was basically, look, we have so far to go, but to say we haven't moved a lot in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, progressives can't in any way ever take any piece of a victory lap. And how do you kind of manage those two things in that we are still so broken, yet is there a way to, at the same time, say, you know what, but fucking we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction and things are going well. And, and how, how do we score ourselves on that front? I think that the, the, the issue becomes how you, you know, Martin Luther King used to say, is not the thesis or the antithesis, it's the synthesis. I think it's the synthesis of the two. It is a shocking and alarming that we're still out here fighting for voting rights. And I, I write about that in Rise Up. I write about what we've got to rise up about, you know, police reform. Man can put his knee on a guy's neck nine minutes and 29 seconds and look in the camera and not flinch, not even think he could get in trouble. That is frightening. Uh, the fact that we still have disproportionate uh, in terms of the economy. Blacks are double the unemployed, the whites. But at the same time, same time, we elected and reelected a black man for president who we couldn't even say his name properly for two or three months. At the same time, when we went and did George Floyd, when his family called me and Ben Crump, the lawyer called me that day, and we started marches, all of a sudden, without our organizing, People all over the world started marching, and many of those marches were more whites than black. When I called the big march in Washington last August 28th, we had over 200,000 people there. There was about maybe a third of the crowd, at least 50,000 whites there. And I knew the time that was unthinkable. So at the same time that we're seeing these blatant vestiges of racism, we see more people reaching out, more people doing things. And when you look at the fact that 2020 election, yes, Biden wins highest number of voters in the history of the country for a president. Yes, the second highest was Donald Trump, which means we still got that almost even balance in this country. But at the same time, the same amount of people came out in Georgia a month later. Growing up around politics, the worst thing you want is we're not going to get people out again to vote in a month. Same number came out and for the first time in history elected a Jew and a black to the U.S. Senate in Georgia on the same day. So the yeah. question becomes that you've got to be able to look at the balance and know that what you're fighting for, you're winning some. And maybe the reason you're seeing a lot of ugliness is because you're winning and it brings out some of the, the victory all and some of the biggest that's left. You keep fighting because you're winning. Well, you know, well, well put. Well, well, well put, my friend. Take me back to the day that the first time that you saw the on camera, what was the George Floyd incident and, and with how you just with the eulogy, how you so uh, emotionally, you know, had us all watch in silence for the same amount of time. Can you take me back just inside as you're watching that? I mean, obviously, you're, the obvious things you're feeling average, but is there any just thing, personal thing that at that moment you were feeling? Uh, we all you know, felt differently. I was in the office at National Action Network, it's the height of the pandemic. We were all like told to stay in. I would only go from my condo to the office and back home. I was doing every TV and all on FaceTime. So you got the news on all the time. And when I saw that video, it started flashing back to 30 or 40 years of, of, of police stuff I've seen. It reminded me of Eric Garner, who they had the video of him choked and sure, uh, choked to death. And him saying the same words, I can't breathe. It, it was haunting to me. 91, when I started National Action Network, the uh, first case I fought was Rodney King, who was laying on the ground being beat in L.A. And I thought about all of that. And in the middle of thinking about it, Ben Crump called. And he says, have you seen this video? I said, I just saw it 10 minutes ago on TV. He said, the family wants to talk to you. And I said, okay. He says, can you do it now? I said, right now? He said, yeah. And he connects me to Felonis, George Floyd's brother. 
And he said, Reverend Al, we'd love for you to get involved. You see what they did to my brother. They were in Houston. He lives in Houston. His brother was the only family member in Minneapolis. He said, would you go to Minneapolis and tell people the family wants peace because people were looting and we don't want that. And I said, yeah. And I hang up the phone and I think about it. And I said, wait a minute, how am I going to Minneapolis? The whole country shut down. And I called uh, two businessmen I know. And uh, one was Robert Smith, the uh, a black billionaire. Sure. And I said, uh, how are you traveling? And he said, what's up, bro? And I told him. He says, you got to go to Minneapolis for that? I said, yeah. He says, I have a plane there for you in the morning. What time are you going to leave? And he sent a private plane. Mm -hmm. I called Eric Garner's mother. We flew in and we did a rally and we asked people to calm down. When I got back in the car, headed back to the uh, airport, uh, they were telling me some people were looting at a certain place. And Donnie, I said, let's go over there and see if we can talk to the people on behalf of the family. When I went there, it was not looting. They were having a protest. And i never forget, I'm standing there getting ready to do a live shot on MSNBC. And I feel something tug on my sleeve, my suit sleeve. And I look down, and it's a young girl, maybe 11, 12 years old, white girl. And I'm ready for the blast. We sing, all oh, these people are disruptive. All oh, give the police a chance because I'm used to being heckled in certain situations. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and she put a little fist up and said, no justice, no peace. And she was marching for George Floyd. I got on that plane. I told Ms. Carr, Eric Garner, I said, this is different. And when we came back to do the funeral, the first one in Minneapolis, I'm thinking in my head, what am I going to say? And I'm looking out at the audience, which was socially distanced. Kevin Hart is there. Uh, Tiffany Haddish is there. T.I. is there. Uh, uh, ludicrous. All our stars are sitting there and the family and about 300 people. And I get up and I had prepared in my mind because I don't speak from a manuscript uh, uh, because I started as a kid. I was preaching yeah. before I could read. Well, so I'm getting up. I had my mind. I wanted to talk about what time we were in the country. But as I looked down at that casket and thought back to what you just raised watching that video, I said, what really grabbed the country was this man's knee on George Floyd's neck. And if you grew up like many of us did, feeling we could have done better if people just let us get up, if they took their knee off our neck, that's why we related to this. So, and I went yeah. in the riff on that, which became the thing that everybody picked up. But that came to me, not only was it extemporaneous, it came as I was speaking. I did yeah. not plan to make that the theme of my speech. But it was because I'd watched everybody from a James Brown and a Michael Jackson, who I eulogized, who always felt they could have done more, but the system wouldn't let them do more because of their race. All the way down to my mother on welfare. And that's what George Floyd represented to me at that moment, is will you get your knee off our neck? We will get up and do better if you wouldn't hold us down. Yeah, I, I feel that really things have have changed since then. That that was a sound that will go down as a, a a hundred year moment that we will watch painfully. And uh, good has started to come from it. And I, I just people in this country needed to see that uh, that way you you couldn't. I guess this is the wrong word. You couldn't script it. And to your point, to, to that ultimate metaphor. Uh, that you so you know so brilliantly seized on, that it, I see I see in corporate America it's changed dramatically, dramatically. That it is I see companies now paying so whether they're doing it for the right reasons or or because they're supposed to do it, it's happening. You know, right. uh, and it is it is all coming back to that. That changed everything. Obviously we we still have so far to go, but as far as, as somebody who is, who watches the world and watches behavior as I do and watches brands and watches businesses, I see a dramatic shift in corporate America in how they are approaching issue, issues of color and issues of race. No, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, again, some are doing it for facetious reasons, some doing it for profit, but there's a shift. No matter why they're doing it, they feel they have to do it. And they feel that that means that the line has shifted. And I think that it is shifted in the right direction. 
And uh, I, I think that we ought to embrace it and keep it moving, which is why these laws need to change under this kind of climate, uh, the voting uh, rights law and the George Floyd bill. It was Emmett Till in the 50s, the year I was born, that was the impetus for the civil rights movement at that time. Rosa Parks said one day, I was in the room, that when she sat in the front of the bus in Montgomery in 1955 and they told her to give up a seat, all she could think about was Emmett Till being lynched in Mississippi and she wouldn't get up. I think that we're seeing a lot of blacks and whites that are doing things. All they're thinking about is that knee on the neck changed how they thought about it. So what, give me the state the status of the, the George Floyd bill, the Police Reform Act. I know we're stuck right now. I know there's, there's issues, there's going to be issues with filibuster. Talk to me about where we are right now. We are, uh, the George Floyd bill uh, and the uh, John Lewis Voting Advancement Act is in the Senate. Uh, they both passed the House of Representatives. They're in the Senate. You have a 50-50 Senate. 50 well, that's where we are. So talk to me about what happens now. 50% Republican. We now have got to get Joe Manchin, who is the uh, senator, as you know, from West Virginia and Senator, to agree that if they cannot get Republicans to support the compromise voting bill uh, and the George Floyd bill, that they will support changing the rules on the filibuster for a carve out. And uh, J Joe Manchin went and, and put together this compromise bill. We said, all right, let's see what you're doing a week. The week is up. We're waiting to see uh, uh, if you got any Republicans. I doubt if you'll get 10 Republicans. No, you're, you're it's not going to come get down to can if we either change the filibuster or make the exception with the cop. Look, if we couldn't get 10 Republicans to look into the January 6th insurrection, to just look into it, I mean, we're, we're, we're not getting the 10 Republicans. No, we're not getting uh, You know, under the guise of how divided we are, um, should I be an optimist or should I be a pessimist on – a divided country 10 years from now, are we going to get better or get worse? You know, talking about the trend that you talked about, obviously that people of color becoming a majority of this country um, puts more stress on the system. Uh, so what, what gets us back a little, particularly with bespoke media now that people get their media the way they want, that fa half the people in the world get their news from Facebook and Facebook has no accountability for news what would cause us to get more on the unity track versus the disunity track? Give, give me the optimistic look and why that could possibly happen. I think that as we change the laws and we start to normalize uh, under laws behavior, that we'll get there. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure that when they did the Civil Rights Act in 64, people felt that now making it where blacks could sit in front of the bus or you go to restaurants, we're going to have violence. And it probably was turbulence for a minute, but it eases out. And I think as the laws change, as things seem in, it will get better. Uh, uh, you know, I sat on the stage and watched uh, Barack Obama put his hand on the Bible, become president. And my mother couldn't even vote in her hometown of Dothan, Alabama. I was from Brooklyn, but she was from the South. She couldn't vote till she was in her thirties. So to go in one generation from a mother couldn't vote to a black president, I was there in 94 when, when Nelson Mandela became president of South Africa. So I've seen too many breakthroughs not to be optimistic because it's sometime in the darkest of the night that, you know, the sun's going to shine. And I believe that we're going to go through a lot, but I think that we'll be all right. It's going to be a turbulent flight in some pockets. Well, we're going to land this plane. We're going to, we're going to end on that high note. The book is now out in paperback, Rise Up, Confronting a Country at the Crossroads, the bestseller. Uh, you can obviously see the Rev on Politics Nation on weekends on MSNBC, his radio show. Um, he is a man of the people. And I appreciate I know how busy you are, man. I appreciate you taking the time, my friend. I appreciate you inviting me. I know how busy you are. <laughs> I'll see you. So I'll see you on Morning Joe. All right, buddy. All right. Take care. Enjoy the day. I hope, hope you guys enjoyed um, this episode. Vaughn Brand, the Reverend Al really came to play. Love talking to him. Love doing the Brands of the Week. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you get podcasts, Spotify, Apple, any place else. And also watch on YouTube and please leave us your reviews. Rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you get podcasts. Go to, pot, go to also review us on YouTube and leave your comments there. We like to talk about the things that you want to talk about. And we'll see you next week on On Brand with Donnie Deutsch. Have a great week, everybody.
Everybody, thanks for watching. If you like it, hit that subscribe button. And we love having you here watching On Brand. And just don't miss any future episodes. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.